Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hope you're all having an amazing day and prepping for an excellent weekend. Unfortunately, I'm not on camera for this video for much the same reason as yesterday. That is that I am finishing off a couple of reviews and also a few analysis pieces, but primarily that I'm getting over the plague, as you can probably tell by my voice. Uh, the good news is I do feel considerably better than yesterday. I don't feel like uh, I have crayons shoved up my nose, much like Homer Simpson, so that's nice. But anyway, there's an awful lot of news to get through, and I want to start things out with some results for the third generation Fred Rippers. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on the 3970X, which of course is the flagship CPU. It's still comprised of 32 cores, 64 threads, but is obviously on a much more advanced architecture, plus there are numerous enhancements on the platform itself, as we've gone over several times in the past. But it's always important for us to have a comparison, so in this instance we'll look at the 29. 90WX, which of course was the flagship of the second generation. The single core score for that specific CPU was around the 4,500, maybe 5,000 mark, depending obviously on the rest of the system configuration. And also the multi-core score, uh, depending on your system configuration, was mid-30,000, you know, 36,000, 37,000 to around the 40,000 mark. You could certainly get much more than that if you were overclocking, particularly on something like liquid nitrogen, which is why you do get some outlier results. And also, the platform itself, uh, Linux does score a little bit higher with this, blah, 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 blah. But generally speaking, we do have a good baseline. So how does the third generation of Ripper of Threads do? Well, it basically ruffle stomps it and then stomps it some more. The multi-core score is 69,000 to around 72,000. So yeah, it's not comparable. I mean, the third generation is just way, way, way faster. While we're on the subject of AMD, I'd like to bring your attention to the RX 5500 because techpowerup.com actually have a pretty in-depth review of the RX 5500. I'll link them, of course, in the description of this video, although we will go over some results in just a moment. There is one big problem, as of the time that I'm recording this anyway, they still don't actually have the pricing of this GPU. So it's very difficult for us to look at this and compare it against another card and say, well, the RX 5500 is a terrible buy or the best buy you could ever make because, well, we don't know how it stacks up price-wise. What we do know, though, is that the 1650 Super is looking really good. Um, it's actually kind of weird how the 1650 Super was handled by NVIDIA. The way that they kind of locked down the review drivers and then basically released them very last minute, kept kind of hush-hush about it, it was almost like they were kind of expecting people to hate the card. I don't honestly know why they handled it in such a, an obscure fashion. Like, it just, it baffles me, to be honest with you. But nevertheless, the 1650 Super is probably one of the more exciting cards in the 1650, sorry, in the Super lineup. That would make much more sense. Uh, I don't think that the Super lineup is all boring. I personally think that the uh, RTX uh, 2070 Super is actually kind of cool. Uh, the 2060 Super is arguable. I don't think that much of the 2080 Supers, but the 1650 Super does look quite interesting. But anyway, enough talking about that. Let's look at a few of the results. We'll start things out with The Witcher 3. I'm not going to go into the high resolutions on this game because, quite frankly, uh, anything above 1080p kind of ruffle stomps the frame rate. But basically, the 5500 and the 1650 Super score essentially... Uh, neck and neck, 60 FPS and 61.6 FPS uh, respectively, so a slight nod in the favour of uh, NVIDIA. Once again though, we don't have the uh, the pricing of uh, the AMD card, so it's very difficult to know whether uh, NVIDIA are winning or losing in terms of the price per dollar. Uh, the game, well one of the games of the year for me anyway, Gears of War 5, or Gears 5 to be exact, uh, 1080p once again, 
the RX 5500 scores uh, 68.5 FPS, so it's really close to the 1660 vanilla, and does also in this particular benchmark pip the RX 590 to the post. Now that's interesting because that's more the results that we saw from AMD's official benchmarks. But the 1650 Super is a couple of frames per second slower, or actually it's about one frame a second slower than the RX 5500. So these two cards look to be very close to one another in terms of performance, honestly, which is, well, really good. And the last benchmark that I'm going to look at is Borderlands 3. The RX 580 scores 45.8 frames a second, we can call it 46 really. And the RX 5500 scores 47 frames a second, so basically one FPS faster for the RX 5500. And the GTX 1650 Super, meanwhile, scores 51.6 FPS. So there is definitely a slight nod in this specific benchmark towards NVIDIA's card. But either way, it looks like AMD have a pretty nice GPU on their hands with with the RX 5500, it's ultimately going to come down to the uh, price of the GPU. And this is kind of one of those price points where just a couple of bucks, like $10, $20, can make an awful lot of difference. Especially when you consider AIB custom models. Um, obviously, you can't get like a ridiculously elaborate cooler um, with a really cheap card because it starts, it starts to negate the point of actually having a really cheap GPU. You kind of then start moving up to a new performance tier when you go to heavily overclocked cards. But at this kind of price point, $10, $20 can make an awful lot of difference in terms of how appealing a specific card is to a customer, as well as game deals as well. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that is handled over the Christmas period. And now on to the next generation consoles. So yesterday I did cover a supposed insider who claims that the PlayStation 5 is, at the moment anyway, more powerful than the Xbox Scarlet. Additionally, he also added to that that the PS5 development kit, both in terms of the hardware as well as the software side of the equation, is more advanced than Microsoft's. Well, he's actually provided more information and has also been now verified by ZHugeX, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce that name, who is uh, one of the uh, members of staff over at Reset Era. So he's actually provided them information to quantify that he does have industry uh, sources and so on and so on. So take this still with a pinch of salt, but this person definitely is more credible, I suppose you could say, than some random paste bin leak, just for the sake of argument. But anyway, um, he says that his personal interpretation is that Sony are planning for customers to easily be able to migrate from the PS4 to the next generation platform, and this is in the planning stages way before actually the PS4 even launched. So the PS4 launch came and the actual development and implementation stages of backwards compatibility, and it took longer than what it was expected to implement uh, this backwards compatibility. And so the launch is now late 2020. So Sony has committed to delay the product, and then they decided to really focus on backwards compatibility. You may recall that there have been several patents which do pertain to backwards compatibility for the PS5, I've gone into those rather extensively in the past, but if you need a quick refresher, it's basically that the uh, PS5 hardware will, I guess the best way of describing it would be emulate the PS4, and it does so by physically reducing the clock frequency of the CPU and GPU, for example. It will shut down any additional GPU cores that the PS4, for example, did not have, and we've also seen several leaks from Kimichi on Twitter as well, which look like this is accurate. Oberon, which is the GPU code name, it looks like anyway, for the PS5, seems to have three different clock frequencies. So it's uh, 800 MHz, 911 MHz, and finally, of course, the 2 GHz clock frequency. And obviously, 800 and 911 uh, represent the PS4 and PS4 Pro respectively. 
So it's going to be really interesting to see how Sony actually implement backwards compatibility, not just for the PS4, but what they choose to do with the PS1, PS2, PS3. And furthermore, what about the portable systems like the Vita, for example? That would be that would be really interesting. He also added that there was demo show to him of a game which is kind of like the Order 1886, but the draw distance was just ridiculous. Furthermore, full dynamic world destruction plus ray traced shadows. Sorry, ray traced reflections. Excuse me, not ray traced shadows. He said that it wasn't like a game that you could do currently because it's nothing that has been done before, at least technically. He also has confirmed that the system thus far looks more powerful than the RX 5500, sorry, 5700 and RX 5700 XT. Now, I'm not really surprised about that because... From what we understand about the consoles, they are using a future version of RDNA. So the first generation of RDNA, of course, has been found in the RX 5700 and 5700 XT. That's Narve 10 uh, silicon. But from what we understand, and we still don't have a complete picture yet, but the consoles look like they're using some type of version of RDNA 2 because also we see ray tracing support. I've been told, uh, I did cover this in another video, I've been told that the PS5 has a slightly less advanced GPU in the Xbox, uh, specifically revolving around ray tracing, but a lot of this stuff is still up in the air at the moment because we're still dealing with development kits which are kind of early, so obviously not everyone has a complete picture of what's going on. Okay, what about the PS5 versus Scarlet? He still believes that the PS5 is more powerful, but he emphasizes that it's not that much more powerful. It's not like you're going to see the same gulf in performance that we saw, let's say, with the PS4 and the original Xbox One in terms of its, uh, in terms of its performance. He said that the PS5 is supposedly slightly more powerful than Xbox Scarlet, but he emphasizes slightly. He gets this information from a friend who has been making games, quote, since the Dreamcast area, and who is developing software for both next generation consoles, and has said that the PS5 has the edge, and then he uh, adds that he's going to be going to the airport soon, and blah 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 blah. The next two posts, though, are probably more interesting to me. He said that they've just got updated uh, Scarlet development kits, and there's going to be new PS5 development kits, which are due soon. He doesn't have the updated DualShock 5 yet. And we covered that also quite recently in a video. It essentially looks really like the DualShock 4, albeit with a few differences. There's no light bar, for example, which personally I'm really happy about. Uh, and obviously it's got those haptic feedback triggers and so on and so on. The game that he's producing, uh, his friend, is going to be available on four different platforms. And the game is not going to launch until 2021. He said that he doesn't believe that the designs so far of the Scarlet or the PS5 are final in terms of the development kits, so it's still coming out. Weirdly enough, he believes that the most exciting platform is Stadia. I think he's probably about the only person on the planet that thinks Stadia is about the most exciting platform. I mean, that was a bit mean, wasn't it? That was that was kind of mean. Anyway, uh, he also added that historically, uh, PlayStation SDKs have more memory, but the same performance as retail units. So he doesn't expect Prospero to be any different. And that's another name, of course, we've seen associated with the PlayStation, that is the PS5 development hardware. With Microsoft, it's a bit more guesswork. The Scorpion SDK was 6.6 teraflops because it had 44 compute units. That's pretty accurate from what I remember from when the console launched. Pretty sure I heard it had 44 CUs. And of course, they disabled four of those for the retail machines. And also, both APUs have variable rate shading, which is going to be really uh, cool. And the final thing that I'd like to bring your attention to is a patent which has been discovered on the internet. And this patent pertains to the Xbox, and, well, we think it's the Xbox, and virtual reality. There has been a virtual reality floor mat 
activity region pattern that has been discovered. I'm not going to read through the entire pattern because you can see through you can see excuse me some of the illustrations yourself. But it's going to be interesting if Microsoft do, do really push virtual reality for the Xbox. It was actually a rumor for the last generation Xbox, but then there were a series of events, and of course they never did it. Obviously, Sony already have uh, virtual reality with the PSVR, and obviously they're uh, updating that for the next generation PlayStation as well. And updates look pretty impressive from what we ascertained via patents and a couple of leaks. So... I would not be surprised at all if Microsoft do the same for the Xbox. Uh, and I think that just about does it for this particular video. So hopefully you have enjoyed it. If you did, then of course, well, leave a like on the video because it helps us out a ton. And also uh, subscribe to the channel for much more content. And you can also follow us on the social medias, which are also linked, of course, in the description of this very video. But for now, I'm going to let you all go. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.